The Mystical Evolution in the Development and Vitality of the Church Part 20 Part 3 The Mystical Evolution of the Entire Church Chapter 10 Integral Life and Collective Evolution the Church is the vastest, most complex, and in every way the most ad admirable of all living organisms. As the mystical society of all the Christian faithful, it enjoys a real and true life, and not merely a moral life, as do merely human societies, because it has Jesus Christ as its head, and his divine spirit as its soul. The Church evolves in a prodigious manner, both in doctrine and organization, for, like Jesus, it grows in age and wisdom. All its doctrinal, disciplinary, and organic process is ordained to mystical growth, to the increase of grace and sanctification, or, rather, to the augmentation of the supernatural life which the divine paraclete is continually imparting to it, so that it may have life and have it more abundantly. Pure doctrine, however lofty it may be, if it lacks the spirit which vivifies, is an empty word and a dead letter which often kills. Likewise, all the sciences, human and divine together, if not inspired and informed by charity, are vain fantasies and fickle wind. They puff up, but they do not edify, much less vivify. But the spirit vivifies and charity edifies. Without the spirit who diffuses the charity of God throughout the organism, the organism itself would be useless. Quote, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profit it nothing, unquote. Therefore, quote, unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it, unquote. When the various members of the mystical body of the church have been vivified, animated, and quickened by the Spirit of Jesus, and when they have been developed, edified, adapted, co-related, subordinated and consolidated by charity, the church as a whole grows and develops. In this consists its mystical evolution and progress. Vital Solidarity of the Christian Faithful Together with the church, we can also say that Jesus Christ himself evolves and increases as the invisible head who diffuses his power to all the members and is incorporated in them and formed in them. We can also say that a certain manner the Holy Ghost evolves and expands in the church as a soul which vivifies it as he gradually manifests and lets shine forth his divine energy making more rich and abundant the diffusion of his gifts in the measure of the particular members become more numerous and robust and are diversified, adapted, and made more apt and worthy. As the church grows, progresses, and luxuriantly develops, we can say that Jesus Christ also progresses anew in it, quote, in wisdom in age and in grace before God and men. Unquote. And as that same church is matured, fully developed, and filled with vigor and life, variety and beauty, we can say that it is Jesus Christ himself fully grown and perfect, extending to us his beneficent activity, prolonging his stay on earth, and performing through his ministers and all the faithful, as though through so many organs, the functions and works of his redemptive mission. Such is the doctrine of the Apostle St. Paul. But just as the soul is at the same time holy in the entire body and whole in each of its parts, so also the Spirit of Jesus, who animates the Church, 
is entire in each living member of the church. As long as the members do not resist him, he refashions them into the image of the divine model. He thus enables each one to put on Jesus Christ that Christ be formed in them. Galatians chapter 4 verse 19 and that each in his way will continue the mission of the Savior and complete his work, so that Christ works and suffers anew in each one and in all. For whatever is done or suffered in the supernatural order is done and suffered through the power and grace of the Redeemer, and therefore it merits eternal life. All work pleasing to God and all the means of realizing it says St. Gertrude, come only from Jesus Christ and his grace. With his grace, we do all that we are able to do, as if they were his own works, and God accepts them as such. Certain actions of man can be very good and honorable, but only if they are performed in intimate union with those of Jesus Christ do they have an infinite value in the eyes of God. Quote, when a living member of the mystical body of Jesus Christ, unquote, observes vice, quote, performs a good work with the power which he receives from the head, then that is a work of the head performed through that member, and, as the work of the Redeemer, it greatly increases the treasure of merits which he acquired for us during his holy life on earth. Just as the effects of the redemption did not cease with the life of Christ on earth, so neither is the treasure of his merits replenished solely with what he realized while living in the flesh, but it always increasing with what he continues to suffer in his members. The head did what was his to do. The members must effect that which falls to their part. Truly, it is Jesus Christ who does all things, but he does not do them all personally. Some things he did while he lived on earth, but the rest he effects through his members here below. But for him there is no difference. So intimately is he joined by love to that body. Thus he places the merits of his members in the same treasury with his own, as if they were all one. Unquote. From the accumulation of merits comes the marvelous condensation which the Holy Mother the Church manifests towards sinners, reconciling them in virtue of the blood of Jesus Christ in the sacrament of penance as long as they truly seek it, and even remitting the satisfaction, which is usually nothing at all when compared to public penance in the early Church, by virtue of the many indulgences which they can so readily gain. These indulgences consist precisely in the application of the superabundant, satisfactory merits of the saints, together with those of the Savior and the Blessed Virgin, to the needy faithful, for all members of the one body, and thus one can, in great measure, supply and satisfy for others. Hence Christ considers as done by himself the least work performed by his servants and all their works and sufferings. He reckons as his own and he complains at being persecuted in them. The blood of the martyrs is his blood flowing anew. Quote, These are they who have come out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and they have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Unquote. Christ himself, in the person of his vicar, St. Peter, is crucified again. Quote, I go to Rome to be crucified again, unquote. Therefore, he who hears his ministers who are charged to speak in his name, his martyrs who give testimony to his truth and power, or his confessors and virgins who bear witness to his holiness and purity, for the glory of God, hears him, and he who despises these despises him. With even greater reason, he who hears the church and is united to it, 
hears and is united to Jesus Christ, but if not, he denies Christ and is separated from him. Hence, heretics and schismatics who refuse to hear the church are necessarily separated from Jesus Christ. To desire to be united directly with him without being a subordinated part of his mystical body is folly. The amputated member is no longer in communication with the head. It receives no life from the soul, and normally it cannot be reanimated and reformed as long as it does not adhere to the body. So the Protestants, in denying the authority of the Church, were logical with the logic of error, in denying also the necessity of good works or of imitating the divine model. They do not wish mortification. They do not wish to be crucified with Jesus Christ. They do not aspire to put off the old man and be clothed with the new, because actually it is impossible that Christ be formed in them as long as they are deliberately separated that which his body and his plenitude. But if we remain united in one faith, rooted and established in charity, then Christ will be in us and we in him as his living members. Then will he strengthen us with the power of his Spirit, and he will not look on us as strangers. Rather, he will nurture and feed us with his own flesh, He will strengthen and invigorate us with his sacraments, especially that of the Eucharist. And he will bestow on us his gifts and graces and the care with which he watches over us. Quote, For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourishment and cherisheth it, as long as Christ doth the church, because we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Unquote. Under the action of his spirit, we shall become his feet, his hands, his tongue, and if we succeed in separating the precious from the vile, we shall be as his very eyes. In this way shall Jesus Christ be magnified in our bodies, whether it be by life or by death, for he is our life, and the church is is his body in the fullness of him who is filled in all in all. Without the head, says Bakuas, the members would have neither the movement nor life, and without the members, the head could not realize all its functions. Therefore, the members are its completion of the same time that they are its organs. St. Paul says that God desires to reunite and restore all things in Christ, in that he made him the head not only of men, but of angels. So it is all that all the power with which we work for eternal life proceeds from him, and only in him can we live for God. In this way shall Jesus Christ be magnified in our bodies, whether it be by life or by death, for he is our life. And the church, quote, is his body and the fullness of him who is filled all in all, unquote. Says Bacuez, quote, without the head, the members could have neither movement nor life, and without the members, the head could not realize all its functions. Therefore, the members are its completion at the same time that they are its organs, St. Paul says that God desires to reunite and restore all things in Christ, and that he made him the head not only of men, but of angels. So it is that all the power with which we work for eternal life proceeds from him, and only in him can we live for God. Therefore we should beg him that we may be filled with the knowledge of his will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that we may walk worthy of God, in all things pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Therefore, we must mortify our self-love and self-will and bear joyfully, or at least resignedly, 
all the sufferings necessary to purify ourselves and become adapted perfectly to the office or ministry that is entrusted to us. Only thus can we fill up those things that are wanting to the sufferings of Christ in our flesh for his body, which is the church. This is a hidden mystery which is revealed only to the saints who recognize the prodigious riches and secret glory of the life of Jesus Christ in pious and just souls. The mission of his ministers is to employ the power which they have received from him, quote, admonishing every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Jesus Christ, unquote. Therefore, as the Apostle says, quote, Let no man seduce you, walking in the things which hath, he hath not seen, in vain puffed up by the sense of his flesh, and not holding the head, which the whole body, by joints and bands, being supplied with the nourishment and compacted, groweth unto the increase of God, unquote. It follows from this that no one should depart from his respective post nor assume functions of other members which appear more noble. The perfection of each one lies in being faithfully adapted to his destiny, according to the divine will, in maintaining a harmony with the other members so as not to impede them, but to aid their activity as much as possible, and they do likewise for him. Thus harmony, health, and prosperity will reign if we all conduct ourselves worthily according to our vocation, with all the humility, meekness, and patience, suffering with charity one for another, solicitous to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. For we all form one body, we have all one spirit, and one and the same hope encourages us in our calling. There is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. One God and Father of all, who distributes to each one of the graces according to the measure of giving of Christ, who descended to the earth, and even to the infernal regions, and then ascended to heaven to make all things perfect. He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, others as evangelists, and others as pastors and doctors, so that the perfection of the saints might be consummated in the works of their respective ministry, and thus the whole body of Jesus Christ might grow prosperously until, united by faith and knowledge of the Son of God, of all of us bear the image of the perfect man, and we are no longer like children carried about with every wind of doctrine." In this way we see, as Scio says, that, quote, in the mystical body of Jesus Christ and in each one of his members there should occur the same thing that took place in his natural body. The faithful must grow continually in faith and in charity until they arrive at the status of perfect Christians. This increase of powers in each of the members will make the body of the church attain its ultimate measure and perfection, unquote. Therian says, Since we have been baptized in Christ in order to be regenerated, in him we have been born to the divine life, and it is only in him that we can live it. If, then, we wish to find the new Son of God who comes forth alive and pure from the baptismal waters, we must not look outside of Christ. This new Son of God is in Christ and is vivified by his Spirit as flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone, and an integral part of his mystical body. If in this body there are all types of organs, as the Apostle enumerates, it is so that all of them may contribute to the perfection of the saints by fulfilling well the functions of their respective ministries for the edification of the body of Christ. And when will this work cease? When, quote, we all meet in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the age of the fullness of Christ, unquote. That is to say, when his body, by the conjunction and development of all the members, 
shall arrive at the plenitude of its predetermined perfection. Meanwhile, this body of Christ is as yet incomplete. It is in the way of information. His natural body has already reached its full development, and it does not change, grow, or become any more perfect than it was when they came forth gloriously from the tomb. But this other and more extensive body, in view of which he deigned to clothe himself in this first, his human body, must be formed throughout the centuries. So Jesus Christ is formed and grows within us, and we grow in Christ. And it can be truly said that the supernatural growth of the members in union with the head uh, is an increase of God, of the incarnate God. Incrementum Dei. If we walk along the paths of God and are firm in faith, living in charity, we live also in Christ, and, reciprocally, he it is, he it is who suffers and is persecuted by us. Therefore, we should present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing unto God, our reasonable service. We should not be conformed to this world, but we should be reformed in the newness of the Spirit in order to prove what is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. We should not aspire to what, to that which does not concern us, but we should be content with the grace that he gives us, For as in one body we have many members, but all the members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members of one another, having different gifts according to the grace that is given us. So Jesus Christ will always work in us, and through us, if we faithfully strive to follow the motion of his Spirit in all our respective mysteries. In this way, his work will be perfected in each one, and throughout the whole organism his action will be increasingly more full and perfect. Quote, St. Paul expressly tells us that the sacred function and spiritual gifts are distributed among the ministers of the Savior in such wise that all contribute to the edification of the Church and the formation of saints, and that all this ministry has for its object to unite souls in one faith, to make known in all parts of the Son of God made man, to communicate his Spirit to all his members, and to make each one of them, and of the Church as a whole, a perfect Christ, virum perfectum, having full possession of his life, his power, and his virtues. Organization and Diversity of Functions Since organization presupposes inequality, diversity of elements, and subordination, the perfection of the organism does not consist in the perfection of one member, however noble it may be, or in various equivalent members, but in the harmonious combination of many members of unequal nobility and diverse functions. In the church, The members that serve for movement are represented by the faithful who are dedicated to the active life, and among them there will be inferior and superior, as in our natural body we have hands and feet. The organs of sensation serving for perception represent the faithful and contemplative life. The eyes. These are the great doctors, the truly illumined wise men who see and contemplate truth. The ordinary masters, who are entrusted with teaching truth, are the tongue, and the ears are the disciples who hear the truth and also those who listen to the voice of the Spirit. The church must have masters and disciples, otherwise it would be an incomplete organism, like a man who is all eyes without a place for ears. If we were reduced to all these organs, where would be the other necessary senses? smell, touch, and taste. In the church there are many who are as yet incapable of comprehending the words of divine wisdom. These words they perceive from afar, and they are attracted by the sweetness of his fragrance. 
Thus did it happen to St. Augustine, when he bore only a loving remembrance and, as it were, a desire to smell the fragrance of that which as yet he was unable to taste. But others not only smell, but they taste and relish and silence the tenderness and sweetness of God, though they are unable to express these marvels. When they taste him through their experience of him, they require remarkable knowledge. Gustate et vidite. Still others, mute and blind in the presence of the ineffable, blinded by such great light, confounded by such grandeur, terrified by such power, and harassed by the bitterness of their own miseries, neither see nor hear nor taste or even smell the divine truth. Yet they feel it as an infinite reality whose weight crushes them and whose goodness and truth completely captivate them and are impressed on them with tangible evidence. God decreed that in the mystical body of his church there should be a prodigious diversity of members necessary to carry out its complex and varied functions. He decreed that there should be every kind of sensory, motor, and regulatory organ with which the passage of time should develop and become consolidated and interrelated. He decreed that there should be a beautiful variety of internal senses and external senses with their respective cerebral and cardiac centers, the soul hidden from the eyes of the world, but very active and filled with the life of divine eyes. And he made these multiple and diverse, not that they should be useless and separated, but that they should be united and correlated in harmonious activity. Thus, the one completes the other, and no single one is sufficient to itself, but all unite in mutual solidarity and contribute more efficaciously to the common edification. The merit and reward will be proportionate to the vitality and activity and real influence of each one. Quote, contemplatives, unquote, says St. Magdalene of Pazzi, Quote, will find rest in the eyes of the word, doctors in his mouth, the merciful in his breast, the just in his hands, the active on his feet, the patient in his shoulders, the virgins, his spouses, totally inflamed with love and perfectly resigned to his will, in his ever open heart so that they will be able to enter therein and find their repose. For an organism to be perfect, it must be made up of many and various members. So the church must be made up of members of distinct orders in every state and condition in order to manifest better the various virtues and graces. With the diversity of charisms, she shall appear clothed with varieties, and by means of hierarchical subordination and the perfect disposition of the whole composite, she is terrible as an army set in array. All the members, then, are necessary, and, although they some seem to be or actually are less noble than others, these are usually the most indispensable, as are the entrails in a natural body. No member, however noble in itself, can ever say to another, quote, I do not need you, unquote. The eye cannot speak thus to the hands, nor the ear to the feet, nor the head to the members. The contemplatives, symbolized by sight and hearing, need the feet and hands of the active members who procure the necessary nourishment for them. On the other hand, the active members need the heat, light, and direction of the contemplatives. In the same way, the head must make use of the members in order to work, and its glory is the multitude and diversity of members. If in our body, as the Apostle remarks, we treat with greater honor and care the members which seem to be less decorous, adorning them and covering them out of decency, The same thing happens in the church of God. We consider the ears less noble than the eyes, 
and therefore they are adorned with earrings, while the eyes do not admit of any adornment. The feet are covered with rich sandals, sometimes covered with precious stones, while the hands are left uncovered. So in the church it is fitting that the imperfect members be given greater consolations and gifts than the more perfect, who no longer need them. And if the less decorous members of the body required a watchful uncovering, which are not necessary for the more decorous parts, so also the church who have committed a fault must be admonished and guarded, whereas the innocent do not require this. All are members of Christ, and, although they are not equally worthy, they must not on that account cease to be united in solidarity. Charity teaches us to treat all our neighbors, whether good or bad, healthy or ill, in a way requisite or necessary to each one. Hence, it is sometimes necessary to act with greater consideration towards sinners than towards the just. To unworthy ministers of the sanctuary, who by their conduct dishonor it, then to worthy priests whose virtues captivate hearts. For ultimately, all are members, organs, or ministers of Jesus Christ, and only as such, in the virtue of the relation which they have or can have to him, do they merit or demand of us the love of charity. Evidently, the weak, sick, or dying members require more care than the robust, healthy, those full of life. It is also true that the more united they are actually with Christ, the better does the work through them, and the more fully it redounds to him whatever we do for them. Therefore the just and the saints merit our veneration, for in them Jesus Christ shines forth. Furthermore, many of those organs that are injured, sick, almost dead, or even corrupted, sometimes fulfill interesting functions for the common good by reason of their minister mysterial power, which works independently of life. Aided by these healthy and robust members, they will fulfill their tasks well enough. Without their help, they will work so poorly that if there is not someone to supply the co- or compensate for their defects, they will cause a general unbalance in the body because of the lack of a function which is more or less necessary to the organism. Moreover, if the human body has a great number of organs and many organic elements or anatomic elements with diverse functions, how much more so in the case of the vast body of the church? In the brain alone we have many millions of cells or neurons without any one being superfluous or lacking its particular function. Each tiny element has its proper office with its particular nuance, distinguishing it from the others. All are necessary if the natural life is to be fully manifested, and if from that great, from that variety, solidarity and harmony are the to result, with even greater reason, that the divine life may be perfectly manifested in the prodigious organism of the church, Each element, each one of the faithful, must have his special mission to which he must be completely attentive in order to be perfect in his order and according to his measure and thus contribute his part to the whole mystical body. Each member, by the mere fact that it is a member, should contribute whatever it can to the harmony and well-being of the whole, adapting itself more and more to the proper office of particular ministry which had been entrusted to it through confirmation, holy orders, or a secret charism, in order that it may be completely perfect and as useful as possible. It should subordinate itself and, if necessary, sacrifice itself to the common good, because in the end this will redound to the benefit of each one in particular. Even the organs that seem to be sacrificed review new solidarity, vigor, and an increase of life. 
But if any organ functions badly, it begins immediately to deteriorate, as also do the others, because of the inequilibrium which is caused. Those that have received greater talents, gifts, graces, charism, or dignities have the greater obligation to work and sacrifice themselves for others, under pain of being considered unfaithful servants who appropriate to themselves what is not their own and do not strive to care well for the house of the Lord. Here is the very raison d'etre of the basis of the heroic Christian abnegation, the spirit of sacrifice, and the excessive tortures and afflictions of all kinds which many innocent souls prefer to endure, and, apparently, without fruit, while other souls, less perfect or even lukewarm or weak, seem to produce plentiful fruit, but with little effort. The former, the pure souls, are the true living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Their sufferings are more than purgations. They are propitiations which make them suffer so that other members may be relieved and cured and work with greater facility. If these other members seem to produce fruit, the former, however hidden or submerged they may seem, have reserved to them almost all the reward, for everyone shall receive in propition to his labor. The chief mission, though a hidden one, of all these victim souls is to continue the expiatory, propitiatory, and repertory work of Calvary, to placate the wrath of God and merit pardon and graces, to do what Mary did at the foot of the cross, to cooperate in the work of our redemption, regeneration, vivification, and sanctification. In a mystical manner, they comfort and relieve Jesus by being associated with him in his sufferings. They make reparation for the offensive, forgetfulness, disdain, and blasphemies of the worldly. They intercept the chastisements of God and turn them into blessings. They obtain pardons for sinners, constancy for the just, health for the infirm, consolation for the afflicted, and a suitable remedy for all their needs. These souls are the blessings of the earth, because in their pure and humble hearts he finds his victim, his delight. He who is a bundle of myrrh and who grazes among the lilies, one of these victims brings down more blessings from heaven than a thousand or millions of the ordinary just souls who do more than purge their own faults and imperfections. As examples of such souls, we may look to St. Catherine of Siena, who was always suffering, praying, and working marvels, and St. Ludwina, who was prostrate on a bed of pain, covered with wounds, unable to eat or sleep, but who passed her life joyfully into the great consolation of others. Or the angelic St. Rose of Lima, St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, and Catherine Emmerich, whose lives were continual peaceful holocausts. The former, though they innocently suffered all manner of martyrdoms, were at least able to see a measure of the fruits of their work, but the latter saw nothing until almost the end of their lives. Other souls gathered their fruits after their lives had been spent, such as Venerable Sister Barbara, who, candid and innocent, passed her life in sorrows and prolonged martyrdoms which seemed to her small in comparison with the desires which she experienced to suffer for her beloved, She endured great suffering exteriorly, and even more interiorly, until her last breath at the age of thirty years. Are you not yet satisfied with such sufferings? They asked her. She replied, No, more, still more. So saying, she expired. When all Seville, as if driven by a mysterious force, came to venerate the body of the holy nun who in life was unknown to them, 
Crowds of the faithful remained at the body for a week and would not permit it to be buried. The body itself, so mortified in life, seemed to be alive. It was fresh and beautiful and filled with a heavenly fragrance. While this nun was enduring her most terrible sufferings, far away the Vatican Council was in session. Quote, what souls are those? Unquote, asked the rationalists. Quote, who can break into tears before a crucifix but remain unmoved at the news of a great public calamity? Unquote, unmoved. Those who truly live crucified with Christ? Those who weep before the crucifix and beg for a remedy for all the evils of the world? Those who, loving with all their heart, feel as their own all the infirmities of their neighbor and can even say with the apostle, quote, who is weak and I am not weak, unquote. Who is it that seeks and finds an after remedy for all public and private calamities, but the Holy Church in whose mystical body those souls form the most sensitive, the most vital, and the most delicate organs? Are these things remedied perhaps by those haughty freethinkers with their coldness, pride, and refined self-love? Rather, by commenting on them as sensational news, they aggravate and foment them. They hail the one who triumphs in censure and ridicule the oppressed, but never do they manifest a sacrifice or show any gratitude. They weep, perhaps, at the hero of a novel or of the theater, but they are unmoved by persecuted virtue and even less by bleeding image of him who, for the love of us, has weighed down with the burden of our sins and who, by his wounds, gave us life, regenerated humanity, and changed the face of the earth. 